Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. We're live with our last show of the week. Our show in the 5 o'clock block on a given Friday, Think Tech Global. This time we're going to talk to uh, Kartiki Mishra, who joins us from Varanasi, India. Uh, he is a student there, a business student, so we can discuss business in India and other things in India. Kartiki, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me. That's great. So um, before we get to business, and by the way, what I've styled the show is uh, India's, uh, um, India's ongoing emergence in, in uh, the world economy, um, I'd like to talk about a couple of not-so-economic issues. Uh, one is, uh, one is the, the rape article that was in, I think, the New York Times a few days ago uh, concerning the number of rapes in India, especially rapes of young women. And um, this is of some concern. It's been discussed for a while. Now it seems to be in, in continuing, if not increasing. And people in India are very concerned about it. Mr. Modi has said that uh, he wants the, the, the penalty for rape to uh, rape of young women, that is 12 or less, or under 12 as the case may be, um, to be increased to the death penalty, which is really, um, that's, a, that's a hard step. What's happening? Can you give us a handle on what's happening in India, what people are saying about this? Uh, certainly. Uh, as you know, there are a lot of crimes in India. Race is one of them. And it is something which has been an uh, issue in all of nations. And certainly there are some cases in race uh, in which young girls were targeted. Uh, whom I can call children, they were of age 8, 12, 11. And in such cases, the uh, cabinet decided that uh, they can hand down death penalty to all the criminals who were found guilty in uh, such cases. So uh, that is a criminal law bill in 2018, it's, uh, and it was, uh, I would say, amendment, a kind of amendment in the criminal law. And they say that uh, such kind of activities will uh, reduce if we have a strong punishment. Uh, death penalty is something I believe uh, can stop rape in India if uh, the crime is so serious, so penalty should be also serious for India. Well, you know, is this happening in uh, your city, in Varanasi? Is it, is it all over India or just in the larger cities like uh, Mumbai? Um, or, well, tell me where it's happening. Is it all over? Is it a, is it a, 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 um, a kind of um, across-the-board phenomenon? Uh, it is something which happens in all of the news, uh, throughout the nation, but not specific about a particular area or a city. But it's something uh, about uh, an issue of, uh, I will say, society, that such kind of activities do not matter where it happens, does have an impact on the nation. Mm. And few were the cases in areas of UP, in areas of Kashmir, that uh, children were raised. So after that, uh, some drastic measures were taken that so that in future uh, no such activity takes place. So they had uh, defined a death penalty for it and increased the sentence also for punishment. Mm -hmm. uh, the minimum jail has been increased from, uh, I will say, some years also. So uh, they have categorized the, how we will categorize it into uh, cases uh, in between the years 7 and 8, if someone is raised to 7 or 10, and 16 to 12, uh, 10 to 20, like that, they have defined that whole uh, punishment thing. Is, is there a cultural overlay on this? I mean, uh, in India, you know, I'm, I remember seeing Slum, Slumdong Landlord. You must have seen that movie, too. Um, and part of it, is, mm -hmm. it has to do with, um, you know, um, abuse of children. And, uh, you know, circumstances uh, b way below standard for children, and I suppose for women and young women, too. Is this a cultural thing where people, you know, don't give proper respect to children and women? Uh, are people, uh, you know, talking about that? Uh, it's not a cultural thing. It's totally about the, 
I will say a mentality of the crime. No culture promotes uh, criminal activity. Even in fact, in Indian culture, we treat women as God. We have goddesses. But it is a kind of hypocrisy that Indian society does commit an act like this. Because we praise women, we uh, devote ourselves to the women goddesses and we can't respect women. Mm. That is a kind of hypocrisy. And I believe uh, crimes are has nothing to do with culture. Mm. Well, so, um, so Mr. Modi wants to... Uh, Make, uh, make the penalty stiffer for rape of young girls. Um, yes. Certainly it's an outrage, but he wants to make it the, the death sentence. That's pretty serious. And I wonder if, um, you know, people, I mean, it's a two-part question, Carnegie. I wonder if people support his initiative in that regard. You think that will pass the legislature? Um, the second question is, um, will it change things? Do you think a stiffer penalty in the, in the case of a death penalty for someone who rapes a young girl? Do you think that will change what, what's happening? Uh -huh, I believe that. Uh, people support it. I guess uh, it is a kind of crime which destroys a woman's life. If someone is raped, a woman is raped, throughout her life, uh, people comment on her that she was raped. Uh, she was also seen as a part of the crime. She wasn't seen as a guilty. But certainly after uh, penalizing them with such a strong punishment, I consider it that crimes will go down. If you know there is a death penalty uh, for a rape, then any person will think twice before committing any crime like this. Mm. So I say that strict punishment is necessary, no matter where is the place. Mm -hmm. Well, let me, let me turn to one other non-economic issue for a moment before we get into the uh, economy of India. And that is uh, Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump, uh, you know, uh, last week uh, he was uh, fairly abusive with the, uh, uh, the NATO leaders that he met with, uh, criticized them and uh, insulted them, left them, left them very unhappy about him and about the U.S. Um, and then on top of that, he went uh, to Helsinki, for a meeting with uh, Vladimir Putin, where he criticized and um, disregarded the, the determinations made by uh, the American intelligence agencies, and in fact, all of them, the intelligence community in, in the U.S. And um, it was uh, met with all kinds of condemnation uh, in the country, in the U.S., and including by Republicans. It was a sort of universal condemnation the day that it happened. And then since then, today is Friday, well, three, four days ago, he's been trying to walk back on that and, and uh, explain that what he, what he said, he didn't mean it. And uh, when he said yes, he meant no. And when he said no, he meant yes. And I wonder, uh, you know, uh, you're a fair witness on this. And, uh, you know, India watches the U.S. And I wonder how you feel he's doing these days in terms of diplomatic relations. I think Donald Trump is not a good diplomat. He is a good uh, businessman, I will say that. But he is not a good president. He is not a good diplomat. In international relations, we should think that what our decision will impact to the other nation. What will happen to U.S. if I take such decision? I don't think he thinks like this. He thinks uh, diplomacy as business, that if you agree to my terms, I will do business with you. If you don't, I won't. That is not kind of uh, policy which a president should have. Mm -hmm. I certainly believe that. And uh, what he did in that uh, healthy summit was something, a very great example of it. He is not a great diplomat, first of all, very clear. Trump should increase his diplomatic skills so that People may support him in future. He should also think about elections of 2020. I think there will be elections, and he he's gonna say something if he takes decisions like this, uh, such rash decisions. Well, you know, it's a great concern to a lot of people that um, there there are indictments now pending in two separate matters in the U.S. Uh, against Russians who um, you know who are indicted to have uh, meddled with American. Um, voting process and voters, and for that matter, public opinion through social media. 
And I, you know, I wonder how somebody in, in India would feel about that. Because a lot of people here are very concerned that our democracy, as yours, is, is, a, is a function of voting. It's a function of how the public comes together to elect leaders and pass initiatives of one kind or another. And when you have a foreign power that is not interested in our welfare, but would rather really like to uh, you know, see us undermined in our welfare and, 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 and sort of you know, get on top of us, um, I wonder you know, how you feel as a democracy um, when it happens to us. Do you worry about it happening to you? Hmm. Uh, very nice question, I would say. Uh, if we talk about democracy, one interesting thing I would like to tell. Uh, yesterday only, on 21st, uh, 20th of July, uh, the opposition uh, said that we should discuss on a no confidence motion or no trust motion on the parliament against the government which was democratically elected with a full majority. You bring a no confidence or no trust motion against the government which does not hold a majority. It happened yesterday. The opposition in India uh, uh, discussed about no confidence motion and that motion was rejected uh, by the parliament. Mm -hmm. uh, 325 people uh, voted against that motion and 126 people voted in the favor of that move. This tells us how democratic we can be. And such things are happening to us all. People can bring a no-confidence motion or a impeachment kind of thing against Trump. He may face it. If people agree with his policies, they will vote for him, they will support him. If not, that no-confidence motion will remove him from power. In a democratic country like U.S. India, people have all the right to question. Opposition question, the government of India answer. In the very same manner, I think, that can happen in U.S. also. Mm. How, how do you feel about it? You know, Kardeki, you're a, you're a student. You're going to graduate soon. You're going to be out in the economy. Uh, presumably as a businessman, you're going to be influential in the way things work in the business community and, and by reference in the political community. Uh, how do you feel about these things? How important is the, sacro the, 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 um, the purity of the voting process to you? How offended are you by the notion that somebody is trying to manipulate the voting process? Hmm. Uh, anything. In the democratic country, uh, I think that everyone has to be. But that say, comes with a restriction, comes with a, uh, I will say, some limitations that liberty is given to people, but that liberty should not be misused. This is happening throughout the world. People say that it's our right to speak. But when they speak, they speak sometimes what is against the national interest in. My question is, can we say that he a talk against national interest or nation will be the part of right of speaking? Will uh, uh, the right of speech promote in about our own or our, your own nation? So I believe that democracy uh, should be taken seriously. Everyone should have a say, but not at the cost of national interest. Mm. How do your friends and associates feel about it? Would they agree with you? Are you of the same mind? Yes, people agree that in a democratic country, everyone has a seat. People, sometimes, if government is correct, supposedly, if the government is wrong, they reject it. Mm -hmm. And this rejection and accepting comes with the power of work which every single citizen has. And if they agree with the policy, they will give the government back into power. If they don't have that acceptance for the government, they, they won't vote for government in next election. Mm -hmm. That is the only first democratic process which we have. Mm -hmm. of every one nation, every democratic nation has the power of vote. Every single citizen is powerful enough to change the government. Mm -hmm. Well, let me say that, uh, you know, I'm a lawyer and I care deeply about the Constitution, the democratic process. It's, um, you know, in my view, the, the finest condition of humanity wherever it exists. 
and certainly it exists in, in India. And uh, although I, I, I'm not sure, I don't, well, I don't think that Mr. Trump understands this conversation. Um, I think from my point of view and the point of view of, um, you know, most Americans, uh, we care deeply about the democracy we have and, and uh, how hard we had to work to achieve it. And we care deeply about the democracy India has and how hard India had to work to achieve it. And we encourage you in those thoughts. And we, we're your, your brothers in democracy. And it's nice to hear you say those things. So, uh, Karnaki, let's take a short break. And we'll come back and we'll talk about what I promised, uh, namely the condition of the economy in India and how it is emerging and growing in our time. We'll be right back after one minute. Hello, everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Hey, Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And they won't let me do political commentary, so I'm stuck doing energy stuff, but I really like energy stuff, so I'm gonna keep on doing it. So join me every Friday on Stan the Energy Man at lunchtime, at noon, on my lunch hour. We're gonna talk about everything energy, especially if it begins with the word hydrogen. We're gonna definitely be talking about it. We'll talk about how we can make Hawaii cleaner, how we can make the world a better place, just basically save the planet. Even Miss America can't even talk about stuff like that anymore. We got it nailed down here. So we'll see you on Friday at noon with Stan the Energy Man. Aloha. Okay, we're delighted to be doing Think Tech Global here on a Friday afternoon with our friend Kartiki Mishra. Uh, he is a, a business student in Varanasi, India, and we talk to him every, every few weeks, uh, usually in a late afternoon because it's early in the morning for him there. And today we're gonna to talk some more about uh, life in India, namely the economy in India. And we have two points to cover. And the first one involves um, a large mobile, mobile phone factory which has opened in the city of Noidia. Uh, can you tell us about that? Uh, how, did, how did this happen? How big is it? And what effect does it have, Carnegie? Yes, I can tell. Uh, this factory was first established in 1995 by the Korean government. And uh, this factory uh, was producing mobile. And after a la large investment by the Korean government, this factory was expanded. And it became the world's largest mobile factory. Not just India, world's largest mobile factory in terms of production. Uh, and uh, this thing uh, will produce mobile, uh, I think, around uh, 120 million mobiles a year, and 70% of the those mobiles which were produced will be used by the uh, Indian citizens, India, and the rest, 30% of the mobiles will be exported to the nations such as Africa, uh, Middle East, and other places. And this will, uh, mobile facility will, uh, I will say, produce from the uh, cheapest mobiles to the most high-end mobiles, which Samsung produces. This, this uh, mobile facility is of Samsung. And uh, Modi, Modi government, or Prime Minister Modi, in, inaugurated it on 9th or 10th of July. And uh, this will help the global market, I think, as the exports will increase from India. And uh, people are thinking that uh, as the uh, labor prices are rising in China, people are looking for alternatives, and the best alternative they have is right now India, with a current growth rate of 7.5% per year in the GDP. So it tells a lot about our economy, our potential. Mm. This, this mobile facility will also provide jobs to 70,000 people, and will also generate indirect jobs in India in that particular case. Uh -huh. This has to be one of the biggest mobile factories in the world. Uh, it, cer it certainly sounds like it could service all the requirements of India, but it could also export the uh, Korean phones, yeah? Yes. So what, what does it mean to the town of 
Nodia. Uh, first of all, Nodia apparently has the, uh, the human resources, factory workers, uh, people who can put you know, pr these phones together precisely to find tolerances, careful technology. Uh, so it's a, it's a comment on the, uh, you know, the workforce in Nodia, but it's also uh, an effect on Nodia. So can you talk about that? What kind of effect does a, a, the construction of a factory of this magnitude have on Nodia? Hmm. Uh, Nodia is a city which is near to the capital, Delhi, and it is one of the most uh, developed cities of India, or I will call it a uh, developing also, we can say. Nodia is a city, I will say, in future can compete with cities like Mumbai, Delhi, in terms of this. Nodia is right because the governments are uh, investing a lot in this city because of the facilities which they have in the city. Uh, compared to the other cities of UK, Noida is very developed. Very developed. So this uh, development has promoted business in the, that city and I think that it will benefit not just the city of Noida but over all the people who are near the city and India uh, as well. Uh -huh. Well, um, you know, what, what, if put yourself in the shoes of, of the Koreans for a minute, uh, the Samsung company, um, and tell me why they would have chosen Nodia, why they would have chosen India instead of, say, China, say, someplace in Korea, some other place in maybe Southeast Asia. Why India? Why did they do this? Uh, uh, India and South Korea share a relationship which is very ancient. And we established our diplomatic relations in 1973. As the Korean uh, investment or the development increased, they started looking for new and emerging markets. And in the names of emerging markets, as China is slowing down, India is growing. That is the benefit they have. For the market, for the products which they were producing, India has a very large market. India is the second largest market in terms of uh, smartphone consum consumption just after the United States. Mm -hmm. So this can tell about uh, our potential. So to keep that potential in mind, to see that growth in mind, we established this facility in uh, India. And secondly, uh, they have a policy of uh, the southern policy, what, it, what they call it by the Korean government, to increase the diplomatic ties with the nations of Southeast Asia, and India is one of the key partners of South Korea. And that's the reason they established this factory in India. So from your point of view, I mean, if you were a Korean, Korean businessman, a leader of Samsung, um, is this the right decision? Did they make the right decision here? Will they be thankful, that, you know, in five or ten years that they made this decision, or will there be risks? Uh, business always comes with a risk. As I as I am business student, I know that no business is without risk. That's certain. But uh, with risk comes with growth. Higher the risk, higher the growth. That is the thought they were keeping in mind. India is growing at a very fast, very fast. 7.3, mm. and it may increase in future. So this will affect the businessmen who are especially foreigners, because they can get special privileges according to the uh, some agreements or some policies to promote the jobs in India, to promote the uh, economic development in India, and, and as well as to increase their own profits by reducing the cost. Producing the same mobile in China will increase the cost of uh, those mobiles. But producing in India will decrease the cost and increase the benefits for the Koreans. Well, it strikes me that if, uh, if they're successful in this regard, about putting this much money in and having a factory of that size and scope, and uh, manufacturing precision products for the world, really, as well as the huge population in India, if that works, and it sounds like it will work, um, then there'll be other similar factories that are created by foreign, foreign organizations in India. I mean, beyond what it is now, and India could become a, a hub of manufacturing, such as China has been in so many ways. 
Do you see uh, India as competing with China for global, you know, uh, excellence in precision manufacturing? Huh, yes, I say that India is increasing to uh, promote business in India. Uh, how to start manufacturing? That was an area in which India was lacking, and China was excelling. India has excelled in services. The best example is IT. Mm -hmm. uh, which Silicon Valley is very good example of. A lot of Indians are working there. So India was good at services, not good at manufacturing. Now the trend is changing. India is trying to develop itself as a manufacturing economy. And that's the reason that our government and various other people who are affected or related with India are trying to set up businesses. Mm -hmm increase the manufacturing in India. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. And that leads me to uh, the other topic we wanted to talk about, uh, how India has replaced France, uh, certainly a Western European country, as the sixth largest economy in the world um, in, you know, in terms of GDP, according to the World Bank, a serious, a serious judge of such matters. Um, so, okay, that's really quite something. Um, and, and my question for you is, uh, you know, what, how did this happen? What are the elements that made this happen? Uh, what are the sea changes that made India's economy exceed France? Um, and I suppose the manufacturer of precision equipment is one of them, isn't it? Uh, I will say that uh, the uh, Indian journey started in 1947, independence, and in 2018, in only just 70 years, we have achieved a lot. We have achieved a lot, which I will say, uh, whole of the African Union, I will call, has a GDP, combined GDP of 2.2 trillion US dollars. 50 nations of Africa combined. And uh, with the whole population of the African continent is mm -hmm. 1.3 billion people. But India did something amazing in 70 years. 2.6 trillion dollar economy with 1.3 billion people. That means we developed equal to the 50 nations of Africa. One single nation developing equal to the 50 nations of Africa. That's the achievement. But one thing I would like to point out, as the developments are increasing, one thing we should keep in mind that per capita income is not increased. We may have replaced France in terms of GDP, but the per capita income which France and India has is oh, very wide. Case. France has a per capita income of I think 42,000 US dollars per citizen. India has a per capita income of 2,000 dollars per citizen. 20 times higher nearly than that of India. So people in France are much richer compared to an average citizen of India. India should aim for increasing the per capita income. We may replace them in GDP, but due to our huge population, our per capita income is equal. So uh, what I believe is we should focus on increasing the per capita income and GDP will increase uh, vice versa according to the decision of this. Well, if I said to you that India has, uh, you know, a long way to grow, that it has advantages, it has not yet, uh, you know, opportunities, that it, it has not yet uh, played out, and the result is that uh, you're like a coiled spring. Once you get started on growing like this, uh, you, you know, you are likely to grow much more uh, than already. So, you know, today, friends, who knows where tomorrow, uh, and I guess uh, Mr. Modi is, is in favor and supports business. So you have a, a perfect storm here, a perfect situation for further growth. And then, of course, of course, uh, Carnegie, we have you. We have your generation of young Indians who are going to look to business and try to make this a, a, a global business center. Am I right? Yes, certainly. And people are starting to invest in business. India has starting innovation so that we can compete and provide services to the rest of the world. And that trend is increasing. Government is trying to promote innovation. Government is trying to promote startups. Government is trying to promote uh, entrepreneurs uh, throughout the nation. This is happening. But it will take time, I think, about a decade or so, or two decades or so, to compete with the nation with, like, US and China. 
in terms of this because the liberalization of indian economy uh, started in 1991 before 1991 there was no such initiative to promote a business in india but gradually the trend is changing and people are getting more much more interested in business as people are facing lack of jobs small businesses medium businesses and large businesses are providing jobs to the people and that's the reason this trend will increase very important very important very important to know about we learned so much from you kartiki kartiki mishra uh, Varanasi, India, business student, uh, the next generation of Indians uh, to make to put, to put Indian uh, Indian business and the Indian nation uh, as a global power. Thank you so much, Kartiki. I look forward to talking with you again in a few weeks. Aloha. Thanks for having me. Aloha.